name is Sinead Burke. I'm a teacher, a writer, and most of my work focuses on making this world a little bit more inclusive for disabled people. I started school on the day of my fourth birthday. That was the 19th of September, 1994. Now you're probably trying to work out what age I am, because you're really smart. I'll tell you, I'm 29. But that very first day of school, well, it was a little bit scary. I am a little person. I stand at the height of three feet, five inches tall. And for my whole life, I have been smaller than everybody else. And in terms of my disability, all that is different than maybe me and you is that my arms and my legs are shorter. Nobody gets to choose what it is that they look like in many ways. I mean, when I was born, I didn't get a checklist. I didn't get to choose to be a woman. I didn't get to choose to have brown hair or brown eyes. I didn't get to choose to be born in Ireland. I didn't get to choose to be disabled. I didn't get to choose my family. So much of who we are and where we are, we actually don't take part in. But what we do get to choose is how we behave to ourselves and to each other. And going into school on that first day and knowing that I was different to everybody else, I was worried. But the girls in my class, they were brilliant. They just welcomed me to the class. We opened up our workbooks and we got started. I loved school. And I think it was on that very first day that I decided that I wanted to be a teacher. When I started college, there were people concerned that maybe teaching would be difficult for me. Maybe it would be harder. Maybe the boys and girls wouldn't respect me or listen to me because they were gonna be bigger than I was. And I was supposed to be the teacher. Even something as simple as, in my classroom, we didn't have desks and chairs laid out like this. Everything was in a U shape. And I would stand at the front of the room so that everybody could see me and I could see everybody. But because I was smaller, we we're all at eye level, maybe in the way that you and I are now. And that changed everything in the class because I wasn't the big adult at the front of the room speaking down and looking down. We were kind of all the same. I haven't told you everything about me because while I wanted to always be a teacher, I had another interest too. I loved and still love fashion. So, around the same time that I was training to be a teacher, I started writing a blog. And a blog is just a space on the internet that is yours to write about the things that interest you. So I started writing about fashion, never thinking that anybody would read it. And it started this conversation that, at the time, I had no idea would change my life. I got to go to New York and give a big talk called a TED Talk, which is where you stand in one spot for 10 minutes and tell the world something that they have never heard about before. I've also got to be on the front cover of Vogue, which is a big magazine. Found myself picked by Meghan Markle, who is the Duchess of Sussex. And she chose me to be on the cover of Vogue. And I was the first little person ever to be on the cover of Vogue. One of the really big moments for me was going to the Met Gala. It's the kind of party where you know everybody there, probably because you went to see their film in the cinema. Maybe you listened to their music on Spotify, or maybe you saw them on a magazine. They're kind of very famous people. And I was invited. It was the first time ever that somebody like me got to go. I wore this amazing dress. It was black velvet with blue satin bows over here. I had a tiara on and it was all made by Gucci. But that dress is now in a museum. It's in Italy, in the Gucci Museum. And they had to make a mannequin to fit that dress to display. One of the other cool projects that I got to do was, I got this email that said 
The President of the United States would like to invite you to the White House. It was President Obama, just to be specific about it. But I didn't think it was real, so I ignored it. A week later, I got another email. It said, Dear Sinead, President Obama would really like to know if you'll be coming to the White House. And I thought, hmm, maybe I should reply. So I did very quickly and said, yes, of course, I will definitely be at the White House. So I went to meet the Obamas. I think we talk a lot about kindness. And sometimes we don't expect leaders or very important people to be kind. But actually, it's probably more important that they're kind than anything else. When I get to meet people who are successful or of note, I'm always so impressed with how kind they are. Whether that is the Obamas, or Jacinda Ardern, who is the Prime Minister of New Zealand, or members of the royal family, taking the time to really listen to people, to not just ask them how they are and to move on with the conversation, but to say, what's interesting you? What are you doing right now? How can I help? I think that's something we all need to learn more how to do. And I got some great M&Ms from the White House. I keep them safe. What I've learned is that when people say that things are impossible, it just means that they haven't thought of another way. Everybody said I couldn't be a teacher or I couldn't work in fashion. And I couldn't, not in the traditional old way of being a teacher, of working in fashion. But I could find my way how to do it. Just dream enormously big. If you could do anything, what would it be? And then work backwards to figure out how. It's easier than it sounds. I'm Paul Gagan. I'm from Tala. Um, I compete in judo. I'm a brown belt and I am visually impaired. I have Libra's congenital amaurosis, LCA for short. Um, it's, it's a bit complicated, but it's a genetic uh, condition that I've had since I was born. They actually thought that I was fully blind until, well, until I was about four. Um, and then they realized that I could actually see a bit. My vision, especially around the age of 16, started to get like a lot worse. Nowadays, I have a little bit of light perception. So, you know, if I'm in front of a window, I can tell I'm in front of a window. Um, and the lights on the ceiling, I can like kind of see those, but otherwise, no, uh, not so much. Me getting into judo, it wasn't quite an accident. So it was more of the right place at the right time sort of thing. Um, so I had started boarding at the end of primary school. So I was like staying in like a residential sort of place. Um, for people who were visually impaired to like help teach them life skills and stuff like that. Um, and they just said to me, it was a Monday night and they were saying, oh, well, we go do this thing on a Monday. It's called judo. Do you want to come along? So I said, sure, you know, why not? Um, and I just like started going with them. It was kind of fun and it just progressed from there. You know, I went and it seemed like I was doing pretty good. Some of the guys who were there for longer, I was able to like beat them. Um, so I eventually started going, that was just a VI club. So for people who were visually impaired. Um, so then from there, the coach kind of said to me, hey, like you seem like you have a bit of talent in this. Do you want to come down to where the like other lads train? It was like a much bigger class. There were guys there who were like really high grades. So they had like black belts and the like. Um, and that's kind of just where it all started is just slowly progressing from that small little class after school to going and training with some of the lads who competed internationally. Even from my first competition, it was the primary schools competition. I think I was in sixth class. Um, I think there was only one other guy in my category. Um, and I mean, I won, it was my very first one. I think I was still a white belt, so I was still at the very start. Um, and I, I actually beat him. I remember they kind of being like, oh, maybe I'm not too terrible at this. Then from there, I went on to the All-Irelands and the secondary school Opens and the All-Irish All Opens, you know, all these sorts of things and kept like, you know, doing pretty good, whether it was first place, second place. It's very rare now that I'd 
come across another visually impaired person in my category. Most of the people that I'd compete against are fully sighted. So I find that in a way, I don't have a advantage, if you will, but like I'm more attuned to how people move. So when I'm like this, holding onto somebody, um, I can like feel them, oh, they're going this way or this way, or they're like moving in towards me. Um, which obviously if you're sighted, they can do things to kind of throw you off. They can like, um, what we call like faint. Um, so it's, it's just about feeling where your opponent's going more so than actually seeing where they're going in judo. So uh, the only real, like I've never had any negative reactions. Everybody has been like quite impressed um, with me actually being able to do judo and do it well, at least in my opinion. It just kind of came from very like small beginnings in a primary school competition to then going on to winning the All-Ireland a couple of years in a row. So obviously things are a bit up in the air at the minute with COVID um, on, because I think the Olympics and Paralympics both got delayed. It's, it's definitely, you know, one of my goals to get to, um, you know, to get back competing internationally, start training properly again, and hopefully one day make it to the Paralympics. Yeah. Well, I find a lot of people are kind of afraid to talk to somebody who is disabled or visually impaired. Um, I don't know whether they're like afraid to upset them or they don't know, but I'd say like the one thing to like keep in mind is that like, <laughs> You know, if you go up and talk to somebody like they're just a normal, like, human or person, um, like, it'll be fine. Like, it, a lot of people, when they come up to me to ask if I need help, they're very, like, timid and they're, like, very afraid, as I said, to, like, actually do that. And um, so I'd say, yeah, like, don't <laughs> be, like, afraid of doing that. Like, most of us are just normal people. I definitely have to be more aware of, like, where I'm going and what I'm doing. Because, um, you know, a lot of people will, like, cross the road and kind of not really like pay too much attention to it like they'll just wait you know no cars would ever go and then they cross but for me i mean i have to really pay attention to like where the traffic's coming from where the people are coming from because obviously like you can say oh yeah that you know that car isn't turning right like but for me it's like i don't know because i can't see the indicator and stuff like that you just have to be very aware when you're like moving around uh, especially inner dublin inner city dublin I, I thought this one was fairly obvious, but a lot of people I say it to ha didn't know. Um, so you know when you're standing at a traffic light and it beeps? Um, that's because it like helps you see impaired people um, to like know when to go. So when the traffic light turns green for you know the people to cross the road, it'll beep faster. Um, and the little like bumps and stuff that are also on the ground at like crossings are also for visually impaired people because you can kind of feel them under your feet. And when you're walking along, obviously smooth footpath, you get to the bumps, you're like, oh, here's my crossing, or oh, I need to turn left here. Um, so yeah, there's a load of little things like that um, that are there to help out people with disabilities. So the coins here are, um, they have different edges on them. So here's the 10 cent. So that, and then the edges. And there's the little grooves here. And that's the smallest one. 20 cent coin, this one. The edges are much further apart. So if I bring my nail across it, there's one, two, three, four, and that's how you kind of tell, well, there's more than that, but that's how you kind of tell because it goes smooth and there's like an indent. So there they are, like that, 20 cent. You know, everybody's kind of at home at the moment. Um, so, you know, if you want to, you could always get out some coins yourself um, and see if you can figure it out, as I said and see which one's which. Um, whether you just close your eyes or you put on a blindfold and try and tell the difference between the coins, you know, you'll feel the edges of it and open your eyes again and see if you were right. For those who don't know, Braille is actually a... So you would read by sight and you'd like see the letters, but with Braille you actually would feel them. So um, it's just kind of like little dots. It's a combination of them. There's six of them in, and they make up the entire alphabet. Um, and it's different like combinations of those. So this would be dot one, dot two, dot three, dot four, dot five, dot six. So it's made up like of a cell, if you will. So each letter is a different combination. So A would just be like dot one, which would be here. Then B is dot one and dot two. And then C is dot one and dot four. So across the top, if that makes sense. <laughs> it's honestly a, a pretty interesting system um, that pretty much any like, visually impaired or blind person that I know would have learned when they were a kid. 
So it, it's just about like actually getting out there and doing things and not being like, oh, I can't do this because I'm such and such. Just at least trying it, you know, is the one thing I'd always say to people. My name is Greta Stremikita. I'm an Irish Paralympian, a 1500 meter runner. I have an eye condition that is called retinopathy. When I was growing up, I did everything. I could like climb trees, drive bikes. I have always tried the things that I wanted to try. I always loved the PE classes, but I never did any specific sport. The PE teacher came up to me one day and said, Greta, maybe you'd be interested in joining Paralympics. Then all the talks about Rio 2016 Paralympic Games uh, started. For three years, I was training and focusing on that goal, and I was lucky enough that I was selected. This is mascot for um, uh, Rio 2016 Paralympic Games. I named it Tom. Rio, for me, was amazing. I remember when the final was on, and you entered the stadium, and it's electric. That is the feeling that you can't describe, and you know that it's only one in four years. I was very nervous, and the camera came up to me, and then I smiled and waved, and because I was like, I was so happy to be there. It's Dream Akita, a fourth place finish for her in this final. After I crossed the finish line, I was so happy because I knew that I put, I put everything what I could into that race. I was preparing for the Tokyo Paralympic Games this summer, um, but unfortunately, it's not gonna happen. Uh, I was disappointed a bit at the start, but then I thought that I need to keep going and I need to keep active and keep training because now I get to compete at the homeschool hoop Olympics. Oh, no. <laughs> and I'm going to win. <laughs>